Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know that this is far later than I usually upload, but I've been super busy with school the last couple of days, and I didn't have a video ready for today, so I'm filming this kind of late. But I think that I, it's important that I keep cranking out these season preview videos, because otherwise I'm not going to get them all done before the season starts. So in today's video, we're going to be talking about the Memphis Grizzlies. Before I get too far into it, though, I want to remind you all to leave a like and subscribe. I've been appreciating all the support that I've been receiving lately, and I hope to see that continue. Without further ado, let's talk about the Grizzlies. Uh, before we can really preview their season, however, I want to start by reviewing all the things that they did during this past offseason. The first move that they made was trading their second round pick for next season as well as a future second round pick belonging to the trailblazers i think that was the deal in exchange for the 30th pick from the boston celtics i think this was a really good move took advantage of a boston team that just didn't have roster space to utilize all three of their first round picks so they really did a great job taking advantage of that and um Adding a player with the 30th pick that we'll talk about in a little bit in Desmond Bain that I think had a much higher value than the 30th best guy in this draft. So I really like that move for the Grizzlies. Next, they traded the 40th pick and a future second round pick in exchange for the 30th, 35th pick, which they would use to select Xavier Tillman or Xavier Tillman. I've heard it pronounced both ways, but I'm going to go Xavier because that's how they said it. During his time at Michigan State in college, I would know as a Wisconsin Badgers fan, I've been had my heart broken by Michigan State with this guy on the court many a time. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I thought that was another pretty solid move. If they would have stayed at 40, they could have grabbed Robert Woodard who, in my opinion, was another player that really fell in the draft. But I do think that Tillman was a solid grab here at 35, and I was not opposed to them moving up to grab him, especially with his future fit alongside Jaron Jackson Jr. In free agency, they re-signed DeAnthony Melton to a four-year, $34.6 million contract, which I think was an excellent value for Melton, as I am quite high on him. And I believe that he's a really, really good NBA player, as I will get into a bit more later. They re-signed Jonte Porter to a three-year, $6 million contract, and John Conchar for, to a four-year, $9 million contract. So pretty much inking two young players to long-term deals. Um, now that we have reviewed and reflected upon the past offseason for the Grizzlies, I think we're ready to preview this upcoming 2020 2021 season for the squad. We will start at the point guard position, which is currently being held down by probably the best point guard on a rookie scale contract at the moment in Ja Morant. Ja exhibited a spectacular ability as a playmaker in his rookie season. He came in and was able to score the ball somewhat efficiently, did a great job making plays for his teammates didn't turn the ball over at an exceedingly high level. All of these things are very rare for rookie or even second year point guards in the NBA. And John Morant came in and was immediately, I guess, even like a fringe all-star level of player. So super impressive rookie season from John Morant. In this upcoming year, I would look for him to improve on his strength, which will allow him to become a better finisher in the lane where he was already quite good. And he'll also become a more effective defensive player at the point of attack once he puts on some more weight. But overall, I am a pretty big Ja fan, and I think that he is certainly the player that this team is building around moving forward. At the backup point guard position, they have Tyus Jones, who is a really, really solid option at that backup point guard spot. He brings the same kind of stuff that you see from so many backup point guards across the league. He's kind of your prototypical backup point guard. Good ball handler, really good playmaker, averaged 8.3 assists per 36 minutes last season, which is a very high number. So clearly he's one of the better playmakers at the position throughout the NBA. 
Outside of that, he also shoots the three ball at a high level, shot it at 37.9% from the arc last season, which was a significant improvement over the rest of his career. So it remains to be seen if he's able to sustain that level of three-point shooting. But if he can, that just makes him so much more dangerous threat on the offensive end of the floor. And on defense, he's adequate for a guy with as small of a frame as he does. He does a good job guarding at the point of attack. I would say at this point, he's not quite the defender that his younger brother, Trey Jones, who got drafted in the second round this year to the San Antonio Spurs is, but he does do a nice job on the defensive end. And with that uh, combined with his offensive value, both as a playmaker and a shooter, like I said before, you've got pretty much a starter pack for a really, really good backup point guard or even bottom tier starting point guard at the NBA level. Tyus is still pretty young, so we could see him make some improvements to his game in the upcoming years. So I do like him quite a bit as a young piece for this Memphis Grizzlies team coming off the bench in relief of Ja Morant. Especially if Ja gets injured, which is obviously not something you would wish on anybody, but when you have such a skinny frame like Ja Morant does, it's important to have a reliable option on your bench that can come in and give really solid replacement minutes, and I think that Tyus Jones provides that for the Grizzlies. Uh, the next guy I'll talk about is kind of more of a combo guard, can play a bit of the one as well as a bit of the two. I would consider him more of a two than a one, and that's DeAnthony Melton. Like I said before, I'm super high on Melton. I had him as my number one most underrated free agent in this up in this past free agency class. It, free agency went by so fast, I'm still calling it upcoming, even though it's clearly over. But uh, I'm a big D'Anthony Melton fan. I think that he's terrific guarding at the point of attack. He makes smart decisions off of the ball defensively as well. And he is decent at creating plays on the defensive side where he uh, can force turnovers with deflections and steals. On the offensive end is where he's a bit more raw. He's solid at getting in the lane, and he's a good playmaker as well. Uh, the swing skill for D'Anthony Melton that will determine whether he is a really solid option as probably uh, one of the first guys off the bench for a good team, or if he can be a starter level guy, is the shooting. That's the swing skill. If he can work out his three-point shooting and take it from that 29% mark he's at right now and get it into the 35 to 37% range, pretty much league average, that will make DeAnthony Melton all that much better of a player. I think that I am a bit of a believer in that jump shot because from what I've seen, it actually looks pretty good. So I think that the Grizzlies got a steal of a deal when they extended DeAnthony Melton and... For that reason, I think that there's a chance that they could look to move on from the next guy I'm going to talk about, and that is Dylan Brooks. I'm actually not a huge Dylan Brooks fan. I know as someone who I've made it clear, I read John Hollinger like he is uh, Jesus. I read John Hollinger's pieces like it's the Bible, but I do have to go against him a little bit when I talk about Dylan Brooks because I just don't really see it with Dylan. Obviously, he has the short arms, which limits him defensively. He's not a very good defender whatsoever. He's smart, which allows him to be good in team rotations, but he has a tendency to get beat off the bounce, which is not a great sign. On the offensive end, he can score it, but not very efficiently. He's turnover prone and doesn't create much for his teammates. So overall, I'm not nearly as high on Dylan Brooks as the Grizzlies front office apparently is. They gave him a huge extension last season that I was not really a fan of, but I do think that with DeAnthony Melton being on this team long term on a cheap contract, Dylan Brooks could be a guy that they look to flip in exchange for some draft capital or even a player that fits the roster, or not even fits the roster, but is maybe just a better value than Dylan Brooks. I think that he would be one of the few guys on this roster that I'd be really looking to trade. And that's what I have to say about him. Moving on to uh, the next wing on my list, and that would be Justice Winslow. The key with Winslow is health. When he's on the court, he gives you a very high-level defensive uh, option. 
He can guard essentially, I hate to say it because it's such a uh, commonplace in the NBA and it's overused so much, but Justin Swinslow can guard one through five. There, I said it. Uh, he's very versatile defensively, can switch both up and down on the positional scale, and that is insanely valuable to an NBA team. We also saw him have a couple seasons where he shot the ball in the 37 to 39% range from the three-point line, which is incredibly valuable to a team. I think that when Justice Winslow is healthy, he profiles as a 3 and D wing who can do a bit more than that with his abilities to contribute as a playmaker off the bounce. What he needs is to stay healthy, and it hasn't happened so far in his career, but I do think that he was a nice guy for the Grizzlies to snag in that Andre Iguodala trade. I don't think that they did as well in that trade as the Heat maybe did, especially with Jay Crowder providing much more significant contributions than many thought that he would. But I still think that getting Justice Winslow was a nice move for them in that trade. And if he can stay healthy, he has a chance to be a high-impact guy on this team moving forward. Next guy is Kyle Anderson. Anderson is very good defensively. I might even say elite defensively. He's terrific in team rotations. He's a very heady player, makes great decisions. Uh, you see that so much out of Spurs, guys, and Anderson is another player who developed in that Spurs system and has come out as a terrific defensive player. On offense, he's a pretty good finisher at the rim, but he has not much playmaking value and he can't shoot. If Kyle Anderson could shoot it, this guy would be a very high-impact role player. As it is, he's a defensive stopper, and that in its own right is a valuable trait to have. I think he led the entire NBA in box plus minus a couple of seasons, defensive box plus minus a couple of seasons ago. He just has such low value offensively that it really limits what he can provide your team with. I think he's another player the Grizzlies could be looking to move on from. I would really look to hang on to him just because he makes this defensive lineup so much more threatening. At least the option of having him off the bench. But, I mean, I'm not sure that his offense makes him as high of an impact player. And I also think that if you could extract some value from him as a team that is still young and still looking to rebuild... I think that would be a smart move from the Grizz. The next guy would be John Conchar, a guy who they recently re-signed to a long-term contract extension. It's four years, $9 million, with the third season partially guaranteed and the fourth season non-guaranteed, I believe. Getting a guy to agree to a long-term deal like this at such a cheap level appears to be a really good move for the Grizzlies, especially since he appears to be a guy that they really believe in. He did a very nice job in the G League last season. He's exhibited skills as a playmaker, and he's also a really solid rebounder for a guard. I don't really buy the shooting. In 181 minutes last season, he shot the ball 50% from three, and I certainly don't think that he's that good of a shooter. But if he can at least shoot it at a league average mark, due to the defensive impact, due to his passing skills, and due to the plus rebounding, I think that John Conchar has a chance to really stick as a role player in the NBA, and it was a great move by the Grizzlies to ink him long-term for a cheap number. Grayson Allen would be the next guy that I'll talk about. He has shot the ball very well in recent, well, I guess just last season. I think he shot it over 40% from the three-point line, and as a young developing player, that's an excellent sign. He struggles on the defensive end, though, and that, along with my questions about him still from the attitude problems at Duke, I don't know, maybe I'm just not a big Grayson Allen fan because of what he did to my Wisconsin Badgers in the national championship game a few seasons ago. It still hurts. Frank the Tank should have led us to that championship. But... Uh, back to uh, Grayson Allen, although I am very biased against him, I just really am not a fan of him either. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I'll move on because I don't think I can say any more because of how biased I am against this dude. I am not a fan. Next would be Desmond Bain. I love Desmond Bain. I had him in my top 20 
at least. I think I had him 17th, maybe even 16th on my big board coming into this draft. I get it, he has short arms, and I just made that critique about Dylan Brooks. However, Desmond Bain is an extremely heady defensive player, does a great job in rotations, is impactful on, on the ball. I wouldn't say impactful, actually. I take that back. He does not really force blocks or steals at a high level, and that's going to prevent him from ever being like an all-defense caliber defender in the NBA. However, I do think that he's going to be a really, really good role player type who does what he needs to do on the defensive end. And on offense, he can space the floor with his elite three-point shooting, and he also has a bit of an ability to put the ball on the floor with his immense amount of strength. He's one of the more muscular guys in this past draft. He's going to be able to utilize that to um, maybe get in the lane a little bit, and I think he's a sneaky good playmaker as well. So I love this pick for the Grizzlies. I think he was so much better than many of the players that were drafted above him. Like, how the heck did this guy go below Yudoka Azubuki? I, I don't know. Yeah, Yudoka Azubuki is going to be a backup center at best, and maybe if his free throw shooting never develops, out of the league. Desmond Bain is going to be a high impact 3 and D wing. Like, I think Gary Trent is a great comparison for him. Joe Harris, great comparison. Like, this guy is going to be good, and he's going to be impactful. And if you're a Grizzlies fan, I guess this is what I'm saying. Be overjoyed that you were able to get this guy. Might end up being the single biggest steal of the draft, along with Tyrese Maxey going 21st. Shout out to the 76ers. Moving on after my... <laughs> Desmond Bain, love fest there. We will talk about two more wings, Marco Guterich and Mario Hezonia. Hezonia has been one of the bigger busts in recent NBA history after going in the top five to the Orlando Magic a couple seasons ago. Uh, he's not very good offensively, doesn't have a whole lot of value, pretty poor athlete, and he doesn't shoot it at the level that we thought that he would coming into the NBA. He's all right defensively, but overall, this guy has been a huge disappointment, and I think that there's a pretty solid chance that the Grizzlies waive him, and he will not even be part of this roster next year. Actually, I should explain myself better. There's 16 guys on this roster right now. If you know the rules of the NBA, you're allowed 15. So, they're going to have to cut one of the 16. The two clear candidates are the two guys I'm talking about right now, Guterich and Hazonia. So, one of the two is going to get cut. Like I said, Hazonia's a big bust, doesn't do a whole lot for you, not really sure what's going to happen there. Number two, uh, Marco Guterich. I don't really know too much about this guy. He played a lot of minutes for uh, the Grizzlies last year. I think he appeared in 38 total games for them, which kind of shocked me because I don't actually remember seeing him play. But, um... Yeah, he's like a, a wing who is okay, I guess. I, I'm not going to say any more about him because I don't really know too much about this dude. But either Hizonia or Guterich will get waved. And the other probably will sit on the end of the bench and wave a towel in the air. So, moving on from those two, I just dedicated way more time than I should have to talking about Marco de Guterich and Mario Hizonia. So, we will move on to the big men positions, which is where it gets very interesting with this Grizzlies team. Jaron Jackson Jr. What a player. Um, he is a, an exciting young guy, can space the floor, is a prototypical 3 and D big man who can space the floor, really shoot it off of the pick and pop, which is incredibly valuable if he can develop his chemistry with John Morant. That is a chance to be a lethal uh, pick and roll, pick and pop, pick and pop game moving forward. Uh, on the defensive end, Jaron Jackson Jr. is an elite shot blocker, does an excellent job of protecting the rim. The problem with his rim protection, though, is that he tends to fall for ball fakes, and that leads to him committing an exuberant number of fouls, which really needs to go down in order for him to be able to stay on the court and be the high-impact guy that he's capable of being. If he can do that, though, 
then this is one of the better young big men in the league moving forward, and the Grizzlies really have a promising young player on their hands here. He can also switch and guard a little bit on the perimeter. Like I said, the rim protection is there, the shooting is there, he's a pretty good finisher. He's a very exciting player and one of the key rebuilding pieces for this Grizzlies team. As much as I like Jaron Jackson Jr., I actually think I like the next guy better. Brandon Clark had an incredible rookie season for the Grizzlies. He finishes the Rock at a higher rim, at a higher rate than any other rookie I've ever seen. Have you ever heard of a rookie shooting? What did he shoot? 75% in the paint and like 62% on two pointers overall. And then he shot 35% from three, which is a very good mark for a rookie. This guy can score the ball with the best of them. Now, the defense is okay, and he's not a great playmaker, but he's a really good rebounder, and he can really score the ball. So I think that that is a super valuable skill set, and I think that he is a keeper. I love watching this guy play, and I think that he was the maybe the most exciting rookie this season, outside of Ja and Zion and Hero. Like... I'm a big Brandon Clark fan, and I can't wait to watch him play again. Also, NBA training camps opened up today. The season's coming so soon, and I'm so pumped. But uh, getting back to the Grizzlies, sorry. I keep going on side tangents because like, I'm just really excited right now for some reason. But uh, Jonas Valanciunas is the next guy. People are saying the Grizzlies are going to trade him. I have a Grizzlies fan in my comment section on my last video I talked about the Grizzlies. They seemed fairly certain that Jonas Valanciunas is gone at the trade deadline. But I actually love him here in Memphis. I think that he's the perfect front court complement to Jaron Jackson Jr. He's a good rebounder, which covers up for Jackson's weakness as a rebounder. He is a terrific offensive player who is great uh, in the post, which of course isn't as valuable as it used to be in the NBA, but he can still take advantage of mismatches which is very valuable in this pick-and-roll-centric NBA. I'm a big Jonas Valanciunas fan. I have been ever since I saw like a documentary talking about Lithuania and how they were the real dream team back in 1992 when they finished third at that Olympic Games that is best known for the Michael, Jack Michael Jordan, uh, Magic Johnson, oh, I can't even think of Scotty Scottie Pippen, of course. Yeah, I I forget all the... Charles Barkley was on that team. Like, obviously, it's the dream team. It was all the best players in the NBA. And it was a documentary talking about how that year Lithuania had a magical run to third place and they were the true dream team. And as a part of that documentary, they talked about Jonas Valanciunas and how he was the earliest drafted player of Lithuanian descent. So after I saw that documentary I became a big Jonas Valanciunas fan and I remain one to this day I think that he's a key piece for this Grizzlies team he fits in perfect alongside Jaron Jackson Jr. and he's someone that they should look to keep around moving forward. Gorgie Jang uh, kind of a uh, guy who was thrown into a trade as salary filler I think the Timberwolves had to attach a draft pick in order to move him over here to Memphis but he actually does have some value as a good defensive big man who blocks shots at a very high rate similar to Jaron Jackson Jr. Those are two big guys who can really really protect the rim well. Uh, he's a good athlete and protects the rim, dunks the ball. I uh, can actually shoot threes at a decent rate starting to develop that and insert that into his game. So, uh, is he a NBA player? For certain. He's a decent backup center and probably has plus value. But is he worth the contract he's on right now? No. But I still think that if they can bring him back for a much cheaper deal, that he could be an interesting backup center piece for the Grizzlies to keep around long term. Although they may have two possible replacements for Jang at that backup center position already on the roster in Jonte Porter and Xavier Tillman. Uh, Porter is a big, big dude who rebounds the ball at a high level, blocks shots well, 
and finishes in the paint. I don't know too much about him. I haven't seen him play in years uh, since I watched uh, him play. I think I've seen him play once, and that was uh, that Michael Porter, when he came back and played a game for Missouri after uh, suffering, was it a torn ACL that he had had him out for like his entire freshman year of college? I watched that team play one game. Was Jante even in that game? I think Jante might have been injured too. But anyways... I haven't seen much of him. Not going to talk about him too much. But the next guy on the center depth chart, I will talk about. Xavier Tillman killed my Badgers for years. So obviously, similar to Grayson Allen, I am a bit biased against him. But I'm a big fan of the way Xavier Tillman plays. And I'm uh, not what not a fan whatsoever of the way Grayson Allen plays. So I at least feel that I can talk about Xavier Tillman a little bit more since I'm a fan of him as a basketball player not necessarily as a Michigan State player but I can root for him with the Memphis Grizzlies uh, he is a very very smart player makes the right decisions defensively is a good passer from the big man position on the offensive side of the floor really really good in the pick and roll uh, makes good decisions out of the short roll where he can catch it uh at like the elbow and then either make a kick out to a shooter take a mid-range shot or take a drive to the rim. He does all of that stuff very well. He's a plus rebounder, and I think that he will be a great fit alongside Jaron Jackson Jr. in the front court moving forward. The questions with him are, does the athleticism come over? Does he have any sort of offensive value scoring the basketball? Uh, is he too undersized to really play center in the NBA? And if he is too undersized, does he have enough skill to guard on the perimeter? I, I really am a fan of Xavier Tillman. I think that I had him far too low on my draft board at 38. I probably should have had him much closer to 30. And I liked that pick for Memphis at 35. We'll see if he pans out, but if he does, I think that there's a chance that he's either a long-term starter or a really good backup for this Grizzlies team moving forward. Finally, last guy I want to touch on. I know this video has been long, but just hang with me for one more player. Killian Tilly, they signed him on a two-way contract following the draft, and I loved Killian Tilly. I had him ranked in my top 40, I think, maybe top 45, but I definitely had him on my board, and if you haven't seen that video, I ranked 46 players that I from that draft class that I believed were going to be rotation guys in the NBA, and Killian Tilly made that list, so there's no reason why he should have gone on drafted. The actual reason why he did go undrafted is because he was really injury prone at Gonzaga and NBA, quest, NBA teams have a lot of questions about his medical. However, if he can stay on the court, he is a really, really solid big man that fits the modern NBA at a high level. He can shoot the ball from three. He's a smart defensive player that is kind of versatile and can guard multiple positions. I love that two-way pickup for the Grizzlies, and I think that they did a great job there. Overall, this roster pretty much stayed the same. Uh, they added the two rookies, but that's it. They didn't add a single veteran. Did they lose anybody? I don't think they lost anybody either, so they pretty much stayed exactly the same. And last year... They were in contention for the 8th seed, but finished as the ninth seed in the Western Conference. However, because of the improvements that Phoenix made, because of the improvements that Minnesota made, I think that they're probably going to fall behind a little bit. I would not pick them to exceed uh, that ninth seed and make the playoffs, but I do think that they will be in contention for the play-in tournament, and even if they're not, I don't think that this would be a lost season for this Grizzlies team because we're going to see their young players like John Morant, like Jaron Jackson Jr., like Brandon Clark continue to grow. And if we can see one of those guys take a star turn and really cement themselves as like a top 30 player in the NBA, then there is a chance that this team could surprise everyone and exceed expectations and really make a solid run at like a 7 seed. Those are my thoughts on the Memphis Grizzlies. I think in a regular season, they would probably win 33 to 38 games. So in this shortened year, my win prediction for the Grizzlies is, I would say they'll go somewhere between 28 and 44 and 
34, wait, 28 and 44, and 34 and 38. There we go. Good math. I know how to make two numbers add up and equal 72. So yeah, that's my thoughts on the Memphis Grizzlies for the upcoming season. Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. I think that's going to be it for me. Oh, leave a comment on what your win total prediction for the Grizzlies is. That's it for me, ladies and gentlemen. I will see you all again very soon.